Uh, my name is Mohamed Zaid. Uh, I'll be the moder moderator for this session. Uh, today we have Tomer and Itai, who will be talking about their experience using Databricks for implementing security at Akamai. Let's take it away. And there is a, a mic on the stand here. Uh, when we have, when the session is, uh, when the presentation is done, if you have questions, please line up behind the mic and we'll take turns. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Strong stuff. So, hi, everyone. Uh, Tom and I are very happy to be here uh, for the second time in two days. Uh, and if you've been here for our talk uh, yesterday, uh, this is going to be a sort of a part two. But if you haven't been, uh, don't worry, we'll cover you. Uh, so just before we start, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with that? Right? Yeah, probably everyone. Uh, because, you know, it, it's probably okay if it will take you 30 or 40 minutes to get out of the bed uh, in the morning. However, it's not OK for a user to wait for 30 minutes to uh, dashboard to load, right? So it's definitely not acceptable for a customer-facing analytics platform. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about today, uh, unleashing the power of interactive analytics at scale with Databricks and Delta Lake. So uh, my name is Itai Affe. I'm a senior big data architect at uh, Akamai. And uh, with me is Tom Patel who's an engineering manager at Akamai, and you can reach both of us over Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, you know, the social media network close to your uh, home. Um, so what we'll learn today, uh, we'll talk about the concept of a customer-facing analytic uh, platform. Uh, we'll talk about building such a platform uh, with Databricks and Delta Lake, and we'll uh, provide you some best practices for optimizing both cost and performance of such a platform. So a little bit about uh, Akamai. Uh, our motto is we power and protect life online. And the company was founded over 20 years ago to solve uh, uh, what was then the toughest challenge uh, of the early days of the internet, uh, what was sometimes jokingly referred to as the worldwide wait. Today, Akamai has three main pillars. The first one is CDN, or Content Delivery Network. And the goal is essentially to serve the data as close as possible to the end users, which is each and every one of us. The second pillar is security, and uh, the goal is uh, to secure the data, the systems, uh, the workloads, etc., of Akamai's customers, but eventually also us as uh, uh, the customers or end users. And the third and relatively newer pillar is uh, Akamai's connected cloud or cloud uh, computing, which is the ability for Akamai's customers and prospects uh, to run uh, workloads and applications securely on Akamai's cloud. Um, I don't know if you know that, but this staggering number, I would say, 30% of all internet traffic goes through Akamai servers, right? So pretty much one out of three actions you're doing in your mobile phone right now, or a laptop, or, or whatnot, go through our servers. We have over 10,000 employees worldwide, and another uh, crazy number. So as of about a year ago, uh, Akamai processed about 50 exabytes uh, of data uh, on top of Databricks. So what's the, uh, what is a customer-facing analytics platform? Essentially, it's a platform that allows end users to analyze data and take uh, informed actions. Now, we'll uh, look at a specific example that's called Web Security Analytics, or WSA, which is uh, Akamai's uh, uh, unified platform that enables our customers to uh, analyze a uh, wide variety of security events and take informed actions in real time. So if we look at the uh, four traits we mentioned earlier of, of a customer-facing analytics platform, let's break it down by uh, each one of them. So if we talk about end users, uh, a general example might be marketers or publishers if we are in ad tech. And for our system, for WSA, it can be the SOC teams in the different organizations. Uh, about uh, the, the second trait of analyzing the data, so generally speaking, it's about accessing the data and then slicing and dicing, uh, dicing sorry, through the data. And with regards to WSA, we're talking about over 60 dimensions, uh, which gives us an almost infinite number of filter combinations, which means we cannot pre-process or pre-compute uh, the results. Queries can scan hundreds of terabytes, and the results should return in up to 10 seconds for 99% of those queries. 
The third trait of the data, so generally speaking, uh, we're talking about things like real-time versus historical data, and also trends versus specific transactions or records. In WSA, uh, it means that the security events need to be uh, available for query or visible in our data lake um, five minutes after they were intercepted by our uh, edge servers. And also, we are required to provide our customers both high-level statistics and ability to drill down uh, into the raw data and into the specific event level. And uh, with regards to the fourth trait of informed action, so generally speaking, it can be, for example, choosing a target audience uh, for an advertising campaign. And for WSA, it means we need to allow our customers to mitigate security attacks as soon as they happen and not uh, as a post-mortem. So how do we build such a scalable uh, customer-facing analytics platform with uh, Databricks and Delta Lake? So first of all, when uh, our group started off with this mission, uh, we looked at a few uh, uh, aspects, right? So we looked at uh, the alternatives with regards to cate the category aspects, such as you know, crossing engines, such as Spark or Flink, uh, and query engines. And we also looked at the provider aspect. So there are uh, in-house uh, solutions, propriety, open source solutions, and also self-managed versus fully managed solutions. With regards to the comparison matrix, uh, uh, sorry, metrics, there are many more uh, than we listed here, but uh, at high level, we're talking about cost. Well, everybody are talking about cost these days, right? Uh, but also functionality, performance, uh, SLA, and ecosystem, which is also very important. So why did we choose uh, Databricks? So from the uh, category aspect, uh, we, well, you've heard from the keynotes and from all sessions today, so it's a unified platform for all your data and AI workloads. It has Spark as a processing engine. It has Databricks SQL, which behind the scenes is also uh, Spark on steroids, so to speak, for query engine. Uh, it provides a self-service uh, data science and uh, ML platform, which was a huge productivity boost for our threat researchers. And uh, it provides us with a single source of truth for our data lake. From the provider aspect, uh, Databricks, as you know, it's a managed and open core solution which means it's based on open source technologies, and you've heard about it in the keynotes uh, several times today. But it also provides us with both the ecosystem of the open source with the additional performance benefits that we get uh, from Databricks Tech Ops. And I'll hand it over to Tomo now to describe how we did uh, uh, or build this architecture uh, and leverage Databricks and Data Lake. Thank you, Itai. Uh, so we'll go uh, on the high level architecture, and then we'll deep dive into what we use uh, with Databricks. So you can see from, from the left side, we have uh, the yellow computers there. This is the CDN. This is how um, actually we get the customer's data uh, through the CDN. Uh, you hear me well? Yeah, okay. Uh, so you get the data through uh, those uh, yellow computers, which uh, indicates the CDN. Then uh, we get the data. We have a layering, uh, uh, receiving layer, which we filter, we aggregate, and we um, extend those data uh, and those schemas. Then what we do, we actually save uh, the data into a storage account um, and then in, on Azure. And then we send uh, just uh, the file path into the Kafka. Uh, why we're doing it? Because uh, there are a couple of reasons. One, when transforming like, uh, or moving this data um, through the, the Kafka, we have a huge amount of data. It costs a lot of money. And the other thing is that uh, basically it, it can't scale. We, we, are, we have SLA, we need to bring this, uh, those events, th those security events into the customers and show them to the UI, you can see on the, on the right side. So um, in order to do so, we can deliver it uh, via the uh, Kafka. So uh, this is why we're doing it. And then we have uh, the box that uh, you can see with the Spark, Databricks, um, this is something that will go a uh, deep dive. This is where we're doing the ingestion into Databricks and storing it in, into Delta table. And then we have uh, on the right side, you can see the UI uh, of uh, WSA, uh, which we query on top of uh, DB SQLs, and I'll show you in one moment. So some of you already know this, uh, that you joined us uh, yesterday, but I'll go for all the other ones that I don't know. This is the architecture of WSA on uh, Databricks. So I'll start from the left side. Uh, the left side is talking about, uh, uh, you can see the Kafka and you can see the storage. This is where we place um, 
the data in the storage and uh, the Kafka is just a file path. Um, and therefore we have uh, ingests, uh, we have ingest uh, jobs which run on uh, Databricks that are Spark, uh, Spark uh, and written in Scala. Um, and those ingest jobs are, right, are reading the, the data from the storage account and then uh, writing into Delta tables which is mounted to a, a storage account. Uh, beside this, we have uh, compaction, which is uh, optimizer, and we have retention. Uh, those are jobs that are running um, in Scala on Databricks. Why, why we are using uh, compaction not on the ingest itself? Because it impacts our SLA. Basically, we, we need to provide those uh, to our customers, and we can't uh, wait with that. So we're doing the compaction, the optimize uh, every hour um, on the last three hours. Um, and the retention we're doing once a day. Um, so everything is, uh, of course, uh, uh, using, we're using basically the, the delta tables. Um, I'll jump to the right side. So you can see on the right side that we have the WCUI uh, and the WCUI actually each user, our customers want to deep dive, get inside uh, uh, their insights, their events, the security events, and even block the specific IP, the specific users, so they need to identify, and therefore uh, they're querying, and we have uh, a backend proxy, uh, which is written in uh, Spring, uh, Java, uh, and then it navigates uh, to another uh, um, Spring, uh, Spring component uh, that is written uh, in Java, and actually from those uh, query builders that we're calling them, we're opening JDBC connection into DB SQLs. Um, so we have different ones. We uh, wanted to leverage between the different types of them. So you can see from the bottom, you ha we have the slow queries. We know which, uh, which ones are, which queries are like more uh, intensive uh, and can impact other uh, customers. And this is why we're separating uh, more, uh, more extensive uh, queries. Uh, we have another one for the big customers, which we know that are opening, for example, um, a large amount of tasks, and uh, we have uh, from all the rest. So each one of the query builders has a JDBC connection into one DB SQL or multiple DB SQLs uh, at the same time. Uh, so everyone knows that, I mean, some of you already know that uh, it's, it's really known that everyone are focusing on performance and on cost. This is like two things, and this is also like sort of a trade-off in each uh, and every uh, company right now. So let's deep dive on the things that we did on the performance and the cost um, and how we uh, try to solve both of them. Uh, so I want to focus on the ingest rate. So our ingest rate uh, is between 10 to 14 gigabyte, gigabits per second. This is, this is quite a lot and it's keeping increasing. Our workload is um, like a wave. Uh, so it means that on the weekends we have less, on the nights we have less, but when there are sales uh, or there is a Christmas holiday and so on and so forth. So we get a lot of uh, uh, traffic events and security events because there are more bots uh, in the internet, there are more DDoS and so on. Um, so we have uh, tons of gigabytes of uh, uh, Delta, Delta Lake metadata and this is quite a lot. Um, and our ingestion should be um, in micro batches of uh, two minutes. This is our SLA of the ingestion on Databricks. So what is the problem? Uh, the Kafka leg that, uh, that we were reading from, of course, uh, just keep increasing all the time. We had a lot of issues with that. So for example, if customers can see on the latest uh, five minutes uh, events that, uh, that they have and they want to block uh, the specific IP, the specific user, um, they can't, they don't have the visibility, and this is super important uh, in order to them to survive and to don't get any, um, any shutdown on, on their websites. Uh, our micro batch took about, like, in average, 11 minutes. That's quite a lot, and this is a, a big difference into uh, two minutes. So how, how can we reach uh, uh, this aspect? So one of the things that uh, we were talking and discussing, uh, sort of a partnership between um, Databricks, uh, Azure, and uh, us, of course, we're uh, working on a feature that is called async checkpoints uh, and also incremental commits. So it means that um, if we have micro batches, not on each micro batch, I will also uh, sync um, uh, the, the metadata files. 
it will be after three or four micro batches. And then they can save tons of time. So uh, with this feature, we saved in about like 50% out of it, um, uh, even more. And then uh, you can see that uh, we reduced our uh, average micro batch instead of 11 minutes into 15, uh, 50 uh, seconds. So this is a really um, important uh, feature for us that uh, uh, we used. Um, I want to go about a little bit about our facts on, uh, on WC. So we have a strict SLA. Uh, we're talking about uh, data or query that uh, the customers can see, uh, which is aggregated. So they see a lot of, uh, let's say, um, uh, security events. And uh, now they want to deep dive and to see a specific uh, event that happened for a specific IP, a specific user. Um, and how, how they are doing it. So in the UI, we have both aggregation and the raw data itself uh, that they can search on, they can investigate and drill down. Um, our data is from minutes, uh, from the last minutes into 31 days. Uh, and of course, we need to, uh, we have a strict SLA because all of us are users for, uh, for at least uh, one, uh, one product uh, out, of, uh, out of the field. And when we go to a website, we want to get the results uh, really fast because we don't have, uh, we don't have time and uh, we don't uh, want to wait too much. So one of the problems that we had is that our query response time took a lot of time, a lot of seconds, even minutes, and the users barely can, can, can wait for that, even after the compaction itself. So how, how, how did we solve it? Uh, so the first uh, thing that uh, we used was uh, Databricks uh, uh, Photon. Uh, we started using it. We couldn't use, uh, we couldn't uh, not use it. Uh, basically, it uh, performed uh, better uh, in, in the query side in like six times more and the ingestion uh, three times more. So as you can see, it, it was a must have feature for us uh, to use. Of course, it's specific for the use cases, the amount of data that you have. We're talking about, uh, on our use case, about six petabytes of data. Um, and of course, uh, it depends. So. Photon is double the, double the DBUs, so be aware with that and be cautious. So when you need to use it, use it. It's, it, it's really helpful, and when you don't, uh, uh, so of course don't use it. Um, we also moved from Java 8 to Java 11. It improved our uh, uh, um, GC issues. Uh, basically, we, we add every once and then a GC issue and spike and the query response time uh, took about like in average like two minutes instead of, of like seconds. So it was uh, really helpful. Uh, we also uh, did two more things that we'll I'll deep dive in, uh, which is the in-house load balancer on the all-purpose clusters or DBSQL. We first used the all-purpose clusters and then we moved to DBSQL. Um, and of course, uh, we repartitioned the data. We first partitioned one, one uh, type and then we moved to another one. So we'll deep dive in those two. Um, so load balancer. Uh, basically, when we started to use uh, actually the all-purpose clusters, we had a lot of issues and bottleneck on the driver because we have one driver that actually uh, performs all the hard work and it can't barely uh, handle all this work no matter how much we scale this all-purpose cluster uh, or DBSQL. And therefore, uh, what we thought about that if we'll split uh, this, uh, uh, this all-purpose cl uh, cluster or DBSQL, we can get the advantage of multiple dri drivers and uh, get benefit from it. So what we did is basically implemented um, on the query builder, we implemented a uh, platform um, uh, that will do sort of uh, load balancing. Um, so of course, uh, you know, Databricks is not aligning with, with the caching mechanism. Um, and, uh, and, and we had a lot of issues uh, 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 with that. Uh, for example, for each and every DBSQL, I mean, we, we have a lot of data. We're talking about six petabytes of data. So if we're, we have a specific DBSQL, specific all-purpose cluster, all the time the data is not cached. So this is why we also wanted to uh, add multiple DBSQLs and multiple uh, clusters as well. Um, and now what we wanted to get the advantage is that if we expanding the number of DBSQLs, expanding the number of all-purpose clusters, uh, we can, the specific users that uh, will query on will go to the same query cluster that it went before. So the caching will be kept at the same query cluster. So what we did is basically used um, 
used the, the same customer ID that will go and direct to the same uh, query cluster. And then we can benefit from the uh, caching mechanism. So you can see from the uh, left side, this is uh, the, the old uh, without the, the load balancer. And the, on the right, you can see uh, when using the, old, the, the load balancer, uh, you can see that each and every uh, customer will go to a specific uh, DB SQL. What we did is basically on model, uh, model so uh, this, uh, on, on the customer ID. So this is how we guarantee that the specific user will go to this, uh, the same uh, DB SQL. Um, the second thing that uh, I want to deep dive is on the partition. So uh, why, why we want to go over it? Because we found out that we had a lot of metadata files. We're talking about like uh, uh, 20 even more of gigabytes of metadata, delta metadata files. And that's quite a lot because it's uh, overhead on the storage, overhead on the IOPS and everything. Um, and it makes the, the life really uh, uh, complex. So uh, we changed our partition from customer ID and hourly timestamp into uh, customer ID and daily timestamp. Uh, so for example, for customers that are not big, let's say, uh, we uh, reduced the number of files. You can see from in about like 24 files per day, so it's quite a lot. We can reduce for most of our customers. Um, and the daily partition has just one file because it's uh, daily. It's of course depends on the size of the uh, customer and how much data he, uh, uh, he actually uh, do does or uh, give us. So what we did is sort of uh, uh, POC and benchmarks uh, to see uh, both the hourly and the daily partition. Uh, this is some of the uh, benchmarks we did and the numbers. You can see that uh, we, we sort of t-shirt sized all the, um, all the customers and then we also uh, changed the the query time from uh, three hours and seven days and, and, and more. Uh, some of it are even not here, so this is uh, di like the dilate, but you can see for the big customers, it, it affected even badly, but slightly badly, not too much. So um, we can live with that. So for most of our customers, uh, it, we benefit from moving to this uh, uh, partition. So with daily partition, the cache hit ratio uh, uh, decreases, um, so this is something that you need to take into account. Uh, we did it, we had the advantage of, you know, checking and POCing in both uh, actions, but not all of us have the, uh, have the time and, uh, and money to, to do so. Uh, and of course, the retention job uh, decreased dr dramatically from six hours into 30 minutes on, uh, on daily. Uh, of course, when we have uh, less the, uh, data files, it's smaller uh, meta. And um, we talked about the, the big customers which uh, are not impacted uh, too much, and, but all the others uh, are. Uh, what, I'll show you the, the code. This is really simple, what we did. Um, this is in Scala. Uh, this is the POC. We, we, we actually ran, uh, ran uh, both at the same time. Uh, the ingest part, and uh, this is uh, this part. I'll show you also in the storage. So in the storage, it looks like um, on the left side on the hourly, you can see the uh, customer ID and then the timestamp, the hourly timestamp. And on the right side, you can see the uh, customer ID and the uh, uh, day itself. This is how it looks like. And on the query side, this is also uh, the difference uh, between the two um, from the hourly and uh, the daily, uh, you can see that uh, we're querying a little bit different. And basically, okay, so all of you want to know okay, what are the results? Are they good, not good? We're talking about huge amount of data, six petabyte of data. Um, so we got to this result. Uh, and the result is amazing, like uh, above 85% of our, uh, of our uh, queries are less than seven seconds on petabytes of data on six, six petabyte of data. It took some, uh, some time to, to reach it, uh, but, uh, but, but we got to this point. Um, I do want to uh, move on to the next topic. Uh, so we talked about performance. Let's talk about cost. So our architecture cost uh, tons of money, hundreds of uh, Ks per, uh, per month, and everyone like from the management team are begging us to reduce it. So, 
come on, go, go ahead, reduce it. You must reduce. And I think most of you uh, also have the same uh, thing. So uh, how can we reduce our, uh, our cost and also meet the performance in SLA that we had until now? So we have a lot of uh, things that uh, we did. Uh, first of all, we migrated from all-purpose uh, cluster to DBSQL. Uh, all-purpose cluster, like the DBSQL on classic uh, we use, and this is uh, 25, uh, 22 uh, uh, cents uh, per hour per DBU, and uh, we reduce it uh, quite a lot. We need to remember that we use Photon. So on the all-purpose cluster, we need to pay double, um, and therefore in the SQL warehouse, uh, uh, the Photon is, is automatic uh, from classic. So we get the advantage out of it. Of course, uh, keep the reservation, do reservation on your VMs uh, through your cloud vendor and also on Databricks in regards of DBUs. This is really helpful and saves uh, tons of money if you know ahead and you can plan ahead. Um, we also uh, built uh, in, in-house uh, smart scaler. Um, and of course, we built uh, um, an in-house uh, scale down on the DB SQLs. Uh, by leveraging the, the APIs of Databricks, and I'll show you in one, one moment how we did it. So um, let's go deep dive on the scale down on the SQL uh, warehouses on, on the weekends and on the, the days. So as I think it's, it's uh, rarely on, on a lot of uh, places around, uh, not all the, uh, let's say, the query uh, time frame are all the same, right? Uh, so on weekends or nights, we can see down peaks and uh, and, and not, like many people are not seeing the, the events or the security events. So these are, this, is, this is a graph of our query usage around um, a weekend. You can see that we have from Friday, um, it's about 63 hours that we have uh, low traffic. Uh, this is pretty good for us um, because why? We can leverage this and maybe decrease the, the, the DBSQL. I'll show you also in, in three, a full week, you can see that uh, in peak hours, in around 4, 5, 3 um, p.m., there is a peak uh, until uh, 12, uh, 1 a.m., and then again, um, um, crossing and uh, going up and down. So what we did is uh, we used, uh, we leveraged the Databricks APIs. Um, basically, and we created the workflows uh, on, on Databricks uh, to increase and decrease uh, the, those uh, DB SQLs uh, via a, a notebook. So we wrote everything in, in a notebook, and I'll show you the notebook uh, in one second. Uh, we created one for increasing, one for decreasing on weekends and nights, and then this is how we leveraged it. We, of course, written one code, a really simple one, uh, used uh, ChatGPT for it, so it was even really fast for. Um, and you can see that on the right side, I used the parameters on resizing up and and down. So the code is really simple. Uh, most of it is just uh, prints, uh, even so, uh, just leveraging the APIs, and, and we we decreased basically. Oh, sorry, we decreased uh, uh, about 50k um, uh, per month uh, just on that. So it, this is truly amazing from our end. Uh, I do want to su sum up uh, um, and what we achieved so far. So in regards of the SLA, we met the SLA. Uh, we can sleep better at night. No one will bother us. And uh, we can do more fun things to drink a beer, for example. Um, so the data is, deri uh, is delivered on time, and we have uh, a better query response. And in regards of the, uh, the cost reduction, so we saved hundreds of, uh, of uh, uh, thousands of dollars, and, um, and this is good. And in regards of uh, the ecosystem, so we're running on Databricks. This is a huge uh, ecosystem of running uh, notebooks and all other stuff that we can leverage our data and uh, things that we already place inside Databricks. And uh, of course, to uh, expose later on, uh, expose later on all this data to our customers. So I'll give it to Itai. Thanks. So just before I summarize, show of hands and be honest here, how many of you believed before we started the talk that you can do single digit on Databricks and Data Lake over, on over six petabytes of data for hundreds of queries per minute? <laughs> yeah, book it, I know, <laughs> you believed, but probably 
Mo most of you probably didn't, but Tom will just show you. So 85% uh, of our queries are under seven seconds. Single digit, I believe, right? Yeah. Cool. So uh, as we mentioned, the goal of a customer-facing analytics platform is to allow end users to analyze data and take informed actions. Uh, performance and cost is everything today. Actually, it's probably cost and then performance. Uh, but uh, yeah. And, and lastly, our uh, use case and scale might be uh, unique, but the lessons learned and the things we showed you today, uh, each and every one of you can take advantage uh, in your organization uh, and can help you too. So, uh, and yeah, and obviously, uh, just keep improving your pipelines, uh, uh, your data infrastructure. There's always room for improvement. Uh, uh, two things we really care about. So first of all, Women in Big Data is a worldwide program that aims to inspire, connect, uh, grow and champion the success of women in all data fields. Uh, there are over 50 chapters worldwide and everyone can join regardless of gender. So we encourage you to find a chapter near you. And there's also Women in Data and AI panel uh, tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. So everyone are invited uh, uh, to join in about uh, 30 minutes, I think, something like that. Our colleague, Yaniv Kunda, will be uh, showing how we migrated our, uh, our system from, uh, from, from on-cloud, uh, sorry, from on-prem to uh, the cloud. Uh, and you can uh, find it in this uh, link. It's gonna be in room, I think, 2.30. Uh, uh, sorry, 2.13, uh, in room 2.13. And lastly, we have two interesting resources. So the Aka My Customer Story on the Databricks website and uh, the blog post I co-authored with Liran Bareket from Databricks about unifying uh, your uh, data ecosystem with Delta Lake integration. That's it for us. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today, uh, and we'll be taking questions now. Thank you. Yeah, you want to go up to the mic? Thank or? you. Yeah, there is a mic. A Please line up if you oh. have any questions. Thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. Like, uh, in your first slide, uh, yeah. If you go to the architecture diagram. Which one? The architecture diagram, the yeah. Kafka ingest. Yeah, this one or this one? Yeah, this, this one is good. So oh, basically, yeah. you guys are putting a metadata of your files that's sitting in a blob storage, right? So that you guys can know which files to read. And uh, uh, do you guys consider autoloader? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, you want to take it? No, you can take it. So uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> the, the speaker note says we tried autoloader. No, not gonna. But uh, it, we tried autoloader. Uh, it just didn't work as we expected back then. Uh, it was a while ago, uh, and it, it didn't uh, uh, scale. Think about our, our data volume and the number of uh, metadata messages in Kafka that we need to store. So it's the, the metadata itself is big data. So yeah. so basically, like a. I'm not sure like an Azure what it is like it is like AWS SQLs or something it's not able to scale for your metadata. So again back then autoloader was not scalable enough. I don't know okay. uh, well I'm guessing it has improved since then but back then that that was the case and uh, okay. So my second sorry, question right? Oh it was uh, one I think 2 years ago yeah. let's say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and my second question is you guys are optimizing a lot on a like a data level, right? Like, a, like you guys touched, optimized your Spark, like a, when you're in a Hadoop world or like in a Cloudera world or a Hortonworks world, you go and tune your parallelism, SQDS memories and stuff. You guys do that here as well? Or? Yeah, so uh, we, we didn't cover that in this talk. Uh, there's actually a talk from last year's summit okay. by two of our colleagues about uh, optimizing uh, Spark uh, applications. Uh, and there's uh, also a deep dive into GC. Uh, look for Nir Dror and Kinneri Chavazir from Akamai from Data and AI Summit 2022. Uh, I think it will be very interesting for you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So with cybersecurity, there's like these rare events where the world is on fire. Um, and one can imagine like, uh, like a warmable DDoS where like everyone's getting hit and everyone wants to know what's happening. Um, do you have to do anything to try to be defensive on your data ingest side or on the query side for like these, these very rare transients that are just gonna like slam you? Yes. Uh, basically, no. Can I go? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, come on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one. Finally, I got it. Um, so you see that uh, we have the receiving layer. One of the things that uh, that the receiving layer does is also blocking from you know 
exploding our pipeline. We don't want to do everything. So we have sort of filtering uh, in regards of sort of rate limiting on that aspect. Uh, it, do it doesn't matter for the customers if he has like one million or like two million. He knows that he has an attack and we don't want to blow on our uh, use case. So I, I, we have a good example from like uh, one month ago when uh, one of the journalists had uh, an attack of uh, a cyber attack. Uh, we got like uh, 28 gigabits per second. That's crazy. That's really crazy. Uh, from 10 to 14 into 28. Uh, everything was scaled good. Everything, uh, we didn't add any Kafka legs, but then we didn't reach more than that. I mean, we blocked and, and then it uh, go down. So uh, yeah, we, we must have those filtering also from the right side on the query side, because we don't want a lot of uh, queries to block other customers and on the left side, in regards of the events themselves. Uh, so you're willing to sacrifice uh, some of your event data to keep that uh, very tight uh, yeah. delivery timeline? Yeah, we are keeping track of it. Uh, Thank there, you. there are a lot of guardrails, essentially, on the yeah. On this thing. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, uh, this is a great presentation, by the way. Uh, very detailed. Thank so you. my question is around storage, mainly. Uh, you should have attended guys... yesterday. <laughs> We Sorry? talked a lot about storage, about storage yesterday, yesterday. So, yeah, go ahead, but you, you can ask. Yeah, so uh, do you guys use any medallion architecture type thing like bronze, silver, gold? And right. if that's the case, bronze, like, do you gold. not hit any storage limits, right? Like uh, in, in Azure, for example. Uh, that's my first question. And the follow-up uh, is really on the query layer side. Uh, in the DB SQL world, like, how do you deal with the concurrency issues, right? Um, mainly, like, if you have, doing the customer ID type partitioning, we, we saw that, but uh, that being said, one customer might have 100 users who are then competing with each other, so. How yeah, do you so, so what we do is, this is why we have different approaches for different uh, uh, use cases, so this is how we differentiate. Um, I can say that uh, this is, we, we had a lot of issues in the, uh, that aspect, and the parallelism and concurrency is something that we're keeping in track all the time. So we do uh, customize and more uh, like uh, created dashboards uh, on top of uh, a open search or elastic search um, that we can identify, again, what are the, the ratio of the query, and then, then we know exactly how we can fit those uh, use cases and, and traffics. Um, I know DB SQL wasn't good in regards of monitoring, but it really improved, and now we have a lot of like better visibility on that. So this is how we know we knew how to uh, do it, and of course how to decrease it uh, when we did the solution of decreasing on nights and weekends. Uh, just, just with regard to the store, the first question. Yeah, let's the let's talk about the first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, you can you can catch it uh, when it's published, but but essentially yes, we did have a lot of issues with regard to storage. Uh, at a very high level, we applied some, or, or we used some uh, preview features from Azure, like regional storage, and we also built some, uh, or re-architecture at our own system in order to split the pipelines and be able to, to handle that load, because storage is always a bottleneck regardless of which cloud you're running on. Yeah, so it means that from the, let's take the ingest one, we split out to six at the same time. Each one of them stores to a different storage. It's sort of sharding. And then each one of those pipelines had optimized retention ingest that were okay. relatively like, uh, you know, uh, not the same clusters and the same uh, features. We decreased it, but. Uh, yeah, but so your bronze is kind of split up. And then by the time it's ready for consumption, does it go to like a different storage account? It's a different, the, it, those are separate storage <laughs> accounts, and the, li the limits are on a, on a per storage account basis. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hi, Ita and Tomer. Um, my name is Winston. I work in Comcast as a data engineer. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk today. It's really impressive uh, size of data and impressive uh, SLA. Uh, my question is, I have two questions. They should be related um, on the data engineer side. So first of all, thank you for mentioning that your like, data ingestion job is right in Scala and deployed. Uh, my question first is, what is your um, data engineers team's uh, development environment, like IDE? Have you guys mm. been able to integrate your uh, IDE into, with uh, Databricks uh, cluster? 
And second is how do you guys manage the, your numbers of uh, ingestion data, data in, uh, ingestion data in Scala? Um, do you guys use uh, on like deploy it on notebook or do you guys were able to deploy with jar files? So um, for, with regards to the data engineering teams, uh, they write uh, Spark Scala code on their own ID, and then you know they build it with Jenkins, we deploy the job, the database, etc. Uh -huh. um, we do use notebooks in even in the data engineering teams, but uh -huh. usually for you know uh, ad hoc exploration stuff like that. Uh -huh. uh, but usually, other than the decrease increase uh, scripts, n usually not for production code. Uh, however, our threat research teams are using notebooks. Uh, like there is notebooks with Python for production code and they, they uh, schedule it with workflows. So we have those sort of, you know, two flavors, so to speak, of, of uh, developing. Got it. So to be just to, from my understanding, so you said uh, the production job, those ingestion production job is uh, in Python notebook? The or, what? Sorry? Uh, those production ingestion jobs, are those still deployed on the notebook? No, no, the, the production, the, the, the data engineering part, uh -huh. the ingest code and the, the other stuff are, the, are, are in Scala, Spark Scala. Uh -huh. the, the, the things I mentioned about the threat research teams, the, the internal teams within Akamai that you know, investigate the, the, the event and build uh, uh, ML models and stuff like that, uh -huh. those things which are not portrayed here, but they are consuming the data partially from the delta tables, they are using Python notebooks. All right, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation, guys. A uh, lot of detail. Um, so question about your scale down and scale up for uh, DB SQL, and I see that you use Classic for that. Uh, and there are, you're capturing some spikiness in the workload. Uh, there are some spikes that you're not capturing. Have you thought about moving to uh, DB SQL serverless? <laughs> so Pulkit is our solution architect. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> I can talk about it. I can take it. Uh, basically, yeah, we're starting a POC on DB SQL serverless. Um, it, not, it doesn't work well, so Pulkit need to work more. Uh, but uh, yeah, it doesn't work well. We basically pay more, and uh, we're waiting for some improvements on the serverless side in order to uh, use that or at least uh, recheck that in our POC again. I do think um, that, by the way, that the, the thing is that, it, that those production workloads are a bit different from uh, ad, ad hoc workloads that you don't expect um, the, yeah. you know, or, or sporadic queries. Yeah. And in those places, like in dev and staging environment, we did uh, your serverless, but you already know that, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank we you, everyone. We'll Thank be staying so here if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.